I think if I hear you call me Becky one more time, Six Pack, I'm gonna pop your tops. All six of them. Who are you? Hey, this is Matt Twisty, and welcome back to another video. It's another request this time from Total Meltdown 2. And if anyone has a request for anything, doesn't just have to be reviews, it could be anything random, topic, reaction, a list, what have you. Feel free to send it either directly to my PayPal or join my Patreon. Both things are down below in the info box. And he wanted my thoughts on what I think are the top 10 underrated sequels of all time. And I have to say I had to keep thinking these are not the sequels I think are the best of all time these are ones that I think are underrated and then I get into okay well what makes a film underrated you know technically Die Hard 2 is underrated especially nowadays but is it more underrated than this or that I had to think about because Die Hard 2 when it came out it did well commercially it did well box office wise so it was it was tough to put into I think both are underrated, which do I think is more underrated. But this is the, the list I came up with. I'll explain why. Number 10, a lot of movies could have been put at this, but I put Lethal Weapon 3. Only because I really enjoy Lethal Weapon 3. It's actually one of my favorite of the series, and that's a film that is completely under the radar. It did well when it came out, but no one ever brings up Lethal Weapon 3. But I really enjoy... I, In my opinion, I like it more than Part 2. I like Lethal Weapon 2. But I thought Lethal Weapon 3 just had more of a consistent tone. With Lethal Weapon 2, I, I get that it was trying to be very dark and serious at times. I mean, the first film is that way too. But like, you have the very fun Joe Pesci, all that stuff... And then you have the really dark third act. And just something about that shift. Like you, the beginning, you have the two, ah, oh, you know, very fun. And then just very sobering. I, I, like I said, I like the film, but just that, that tone. Like the, the, for me, Lethal Open 3 was a more satisfyingly consistent tone with itself. And while I agree the villain is not the best, I don't mind the actor though, but I think maybe more could have been done to develop the villain. I still really enjoy the banter between Mel Gibson and Danny Glover. I love the bit where they're in, plain, they're, they're in blues, that they haven't been in a while, and they steer the shit out of a guy, especially Mel Gibson. Oh, Let's shoot him. We could call a suicide. We call an accident. No, don't go that way. Go that way. The beginning is hilarious, where there's a bomb in the building, and the two of them are at this bomb that's in this car, and a cat jumps up. It's almost a cat catastrophe, huh? Only me, you, and this cat are dumb enough to be here. Raj, yeah, get the cat. Get the cat. 
And then, like, big, huge explosion. I thought that was a great way to open the picture. I like the finale and the construction site. And having to deal with the... The armored piercing bullets. I like the bit, the, the serious bit with Danny Glover where he shoots and it's a kid who his son knew. I thought he had some really good dramatic moments for Danny Glover. But also, it worked with the humor where Mel Gibson trying to cheer him up. Where? I think that there's a bit where... Danny Glover, like... Oh no, Danny Glover has a gun and he's drunk. And Mel Gibson's like, what? What are you going to do? Shoot me? And he puts a... You put your finger out of my barrel. <laughs> uh, just the way that I played off. Joe Pesci. Rene Russo. I liked Rene Russo. I thought she was a nice addition. You know, strong, badass uh, lead. I swear there's some stuff cut out of this. Because I swear there's stuff in the trailer that's not in the movie. So I swear there's some stuff cut out. Maybe Jack Craven knows. Because he usually... I, I call him an expert on that stuff. But yeah, Lethal Weapon 3, no one ever talks about. It gets forgotten. And that's why I put it at number 10. That's why I put it on the list. This has always been a sequel I, I highly enjoyed. Number 9, I put as a tie because they both came out in 2003. The Matrix Reloaded and Bad Boys 2. The Matrix Reloaded, yeah, I could deal without the 10-minute TFC kernel pontificating about the eccentricities of the Matrix. That felt like the director's head were up their asses and they thought it smelled like apple pie. With some tweets and editing, you could fix that, but I thought The Matrix Reloaded was a wonderful action visual experience. And I saw it in the theater twice. And it was just such a great thrill ride for me. Oh, the, the spectacle. In retrospect, I do think the on the business side... In retrospect, they should have just gone with the typical Star Wars route. Humans versus the outside. Good guys, bad guys. Humans, good guys. In this case, the robots, bad guys. Fight, overthrow them. Think of them as the Empire. Humans were out. I think if they went the more, what you call, typical route, it would be more successful, critically, commercially. Especially nowadays, they'd be looked at more fondly. In retrospect, I appreciate, though, the direction they took in. It was a brave choice. It was a, an interesting choice for the plot, the story. And so, overall, I do like how it was played out. I don't know what the fuck you're going to do for a fourth film. They've done everything in movies since the Matrix sequels. What more can you do for a Matrix? I don't think it's needed. But I love the Burly Brawl scene where he's fighting all the Agent Smiths. I love the car chase. I think it's one of the best car chases in films, period. Um, I love Morpheus being able to kick some ass. You know, with a sword. That was a badass moment. I love that Neo is getting to Superman levels. Uh, the bit where Lawrence Fishburne and the other guy are flying in slow-mo. And... Da -da -da -da, da -da 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 -da, you sweeps in, tears them off. Yeah, again, is it a flawed film? Yeah, the stuff in the real world where they have their fucking orgy, that's what it looked like, the party. I think that's a film that could be fits more with editing, like I said, but overall I think it was just a very entertaining thrill ride experience. I still do. And Bad Boys 2, it did well when it came out, but again, no one really talks about it, and if they do, they just make fun of it. It's excessive. It's Michael Bay at his most don't give a fuck. Let's be as excessively violent over the top as possible. And you know what? That's the Michael Bay I prefer. It really is. Although I do really enjoy The Rock and The Island, but it's better than the shit he produces, like the Ninja Turtle 2014 2016 flicks. And Bad Boys 2, that's why I, I like Bad Boys for Life. But I still think Bad Boys 2 was a better movie. Better action film and better Bad Boys film. And again, I like Bad Boys 3. But I missed the... That over-the-topness. Like, Bad Boys 2 has a lot of action in it. An exceptional action. 
And Bad Boys 3, when you look at it action-wise, Bad Boys 3 is a step down from action. To, let's be fair. I do think it's better in terms of dealing with his characters emotionally. I think that that's one of the primary reasons that film works. But Bad Boys 2 is just more... I would say it's a... F Bad Boys 1 is probably the funnier movie, but Bad Boys 2 is definitely the most action-packed and the most exciting balls to the wall again just not like Michael Bay just went to the switch of I don't give a fuck dead bodies fall out and our heroes are running over the dead bodies and the heads are popping off they're owed to police story crashing through all the the, the sheds going down the mountain but doing it Michael Bay style just Mar Will Smith, Martin Lawrence is still pretty damn funny in that movie. The way the bad guy dies, falling on the fucking mines. I didn't just not put the blood in there, put the gore in there. Every scene is just Michael Bay not holding back. And it's kind of a joy to, to sit through in that aspect. Like, if you don't do it, do it all the way. And Bad Boys 2 does it all the way. And that's why it's, to me, <laughs> entertaining as hell. You know, you, you know how they say sequels are bigger? Yeah, it was fucking bigger, alright. But that that was the appeal of it to me. So I really like Bad Boys too. Number 8, Short Circuit 2. I reviewed this recently. No one ever talks about this film. It, it's getting a Blu-ray overseas, but there's really nothing new for features, which is sucks. But I think it does even more for the character Johnny Five. This whole thing of people look at him as a freak or a monster. He'll read books like Frankenstein. And he you know, wants a sense to belong. I think he really does a good job portraying Johnny Five as a character. They improve even more so on the effects. Where Johnny Five can do more and certain shot showcasing. That they had even more of a budget and more technical know-how to even more so make Johnny Five a, a character you believe is truly alive. I like Fisher Stevens, despite how un-PC it is to like him. I like him. I like Michael McKeon. The f when Johnny Five is almost getting, getting his ass murdered, that's ballsy. That's extremely ballsy. And to me, that's more emotional than anything in Chappie. Like, Short Circuit 2 is kind of Chappie done right. In fact, you go on YouTube... I've seen multiple times where people have took Chappie trailer and they put Johnny Five in it. And it works. But, uh... Short Circuit 2, I think, deserves a lot more. He's got the... He's hurt and he's being fixed up and he's pissed off. Uh, that was a nice... bit of writing. To have the character develop to that point. And yeah, this is a underrated flick. Deserves a lot more to know us than it's gotten. Number seven. Indiana Jones and the Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. People still shit on this movie more so than the Star Wars movies. You know what Indiana Jones, Kingdom of the Crystal Skull did not do? It didn't shit on Indiana Jones. I don't give a fuck how many times South Park. Oh, look, uh, India's getting raped. Whatever. South Park wasn't that funny anyway. Although I do like their movie. Is the film flawed? Yes. More practical. Less CGI. And by editing. Get rid of a couple things. Get rid of the stupid fucking monkey scene. Get rid of the fucking gopher. At the very very beginning. Whatever the hell it was. More practical. Less CG. Especially in the environments. Like the big car chase through the jungle. That should have been done more for real. With that said, Harrison Ford, I still think he does a great job. Karen Allen, wonderful to see her back from the first movie. And you know what? It actually helps with the character. It gives the character a happy ending. Him and Karen Allen, they get married, go off in happiness. 
You think they're going to do the pass of the torch? But Andy's like, nah, this is my hat. That was the best way to end that character. Uh, the pass of the torch? Nope. Still my hat. People go, well, the, the fridge sequence. Yeah, there's never been an Indiana Jones scene that was unrealistic. Well, that was too much. Really? You're telling me that falling from a fucking airplane in a raft this big. And literally it's like, ah, ah, boom. You don't, you tell me they wouldn't be fucking dead? But it's the steepism. Oh, you mean driving through a tunnel in Last Crusade and then a plane comes in and blows up and go, goes beside them and then keeps going and then blows up in front of them? You know, that's realistic. Oh, it's got aliens. Because it's okay to have a knight live in a cave for a hundred years or a thousand years, however fuck long it was. To tell people they chose wisely or poorly, that's realistic. That that's, makes more sense. But people have a problem with the, the extraterrestrial stuff, which technically were dimensions that go through dimensions of that space. But yeah, it's still aliens. I, I don't. It's not like he's punching an alien in the face, although I'd like to have seen that. But it's not like he's doing that. Shia LaBeouf. I don't think Shia was bad in the movie. I really don't. I don't think he was that bad in the film. I thought he worked well for Indiana Jones's son. He did not get on my nerves. I liked him. I liked the character. I liked the back and forth between him and, and Harrison Ford. I liked that by this third ad is Indiana Jones having a family. It's not fucking Lou Skywalker milking some animal who seems to like it. Living on an island being groucho. Fucking groucho marchism. Grouchy bitch. That's what Lou Skywalker was. Oh, people love The Force Awakens. You think that was a great end to Han Solo? Going to an obvious trap? Oh, I'm stabbed and got thrown into fucking garbage? That was... But people love The Force Awakens. The Force Awakens is more insulting to Star Wars than Indiana Jones and the Kingdom Crystal Skull is to Indiana Jones. Man, that's bullshit. Really? What happens to The Force Awakens? The Empire is still around. But they changed their name and they're 10 times bigger, they're 10 times stronger, and they have 10 times more people. Well, those Star Wars really helped a lot, didn't it? Thank God they defeated the Empire and Return of the Jedi. They defeated them so they can come back 10 times stronger in a decade or two later? That's like, hey, we defeated the Nazis. But 20 years later, now the Nazis are as big of a population as China. There's a billion of them. And they got some Star Wars shit. Now they're going to go into another war. Wow, thank God, you know, we defeated the Nazis and Hitler. Well, Hitler's not really dead. It's Hitler 2.0. See, he was frozen until the, you know. He was frozen, he was let out, and they got to get the Bionic Commando to fucking fight him. I just, his head's in a jar. and Force Awakens to me is more insulting than anything in this movie. Even the fridge scene. It's still got that steepism pulp entertainment. It's trying to be an ode to the 1950s and I thought it did that fairly well. Yes, it needed less CGI. Get rid of the stupid monkey in the tree scene. Get rid of that. <clears throat> it was still entertaining. It was still fast paced. It was still... Nice nod to the first film with Karen Allen coming back. I still really enjoy the film. Any Jones Kingdom Crystal Skull? I've never hated. I liked it when I saw it in the theater. I still like it now. So yes, to me it's one of the most underrated sequels. Number six, Universal Soldier The Return. I, I talked about this a lot. It came out. It got the worst reviews. That's because it came out after The Matrix and all these other movies. And... Universal Soldier of the Return is kind of Van Damme's version of almost a PM Entertainment movie. In a way, if Van Damme did a PM Entertainment film, it'd be similar to Universal Soldier of the Return. 
You know, it's in the vein of T-Force and, you know, those kind of movies. But that's not what people wanted. That's what I wanted. No, it doesn't deal into the dramatic tropes of Lou Devereaux. And it doesn't deal into the... You know, as a soldier, the original did that a little bit. As well as being an action film. But compared to what would happen later... Where Luke Devereaux is blank face, falling asleep while watching TV that deals with monkeys, and then being a fucking zombie again, and the next one being Marlon Brando from Apocalypse Now. Sorry, I prefer this Luke Devereaux. I prefer what happened to the character in this movie. Where he has a daughter. Yeah, it's weird that he's with the Universal Unisoul program. But the way I looked at it is they're doing it anyway. And he wants to hopefully not... The way I looked at it is when this happened to him, he's able to become normal and have a daughter out of this. He doesn't want anyone else to die in via he, like he did in Vietnam and um, I think a bit more truthfully could have been done where maybe you could state that after a while maybe there could be a, a program to bring them into society back to society like he has like maybe have a deal where okay they serve a couple years but then afterward boom He'll be part of a program to be like, in a way, a guidance counselor for them. In a way, I think if they worked that to the plot, it would have been more successful. Or maybe some of those dramatic moments people wanted. <clears throat> but to me, it was a f entertaining B movie. Eighty minutes is directed by a guy who's a stunt guy, and that's where his. His, uh, his tools of the trade came into prominence. There's tons of stunts, tons of explosions, tons of firefights, tons of fist fights. I think the fight he has with Michael J. White is one of Van Damme's best fights in a movie. I'm not kidding. The fight between him and Michael J. White, I think, is one of Van Damme's best. I truly do. It's a lengthy fight. That fight I will take any day with, compared to the fight in Expendables 2 that he has with Stallone. And that's sad. You look at that fight, how each one gets their back and forth, and the length of the fight, and... Van Damme gets thrown through a lot of fucking glass in that. And then you have Goldberg, I mean... I think... Universal, Universal Soldier The Return... Yes, it's a dumb movie, but it's a fun B-movie. Again, as a guy... It's like Van Damme back in the days of canon films. Like Cyborg. Or yeah, if he did Peter Entertainment. And that was cool. People say that's a negative. For me, that's a positive. That's what I wanted. It, it gave me what I wanted. And what's wrong with a film sometimes just being fun? Just having fun. Nothing wrong with a movie being fun sometimes. It doesn't always have to have a fucking message. Number five, Tremors 2 Aftershocks. To me, I think it's the best direct video sequel out there. It's a film that could have been in theaters. Like it has a nice enough production value. The new creatures, the Shriekers, which now can sense heat and they can walk. Yeah, some of the CGI doesn't hold up the best, but there's still a lot of profitable in there. Fred Ward is awesome in the movie. Michael Groves coming back as Burt Gummer. It's still very funny, it's entertaining, it's fast-paced. I'm not going to go too much into it because one of the things coming up this month for the request is a commentary as well as a re-review for Tremors 2 Aftershock. So I'll get more of my thoughts for that time. But yeah, Tremors 2, underrated sequel. Love it. I think the first one is still my favorite, but Tremors 2 is very close. It's a whole lot of fun. Number four, Jason Goes to Hell. I put this high on the list because I, everyone hates the film. That's fine. I think Jason Goes to Hell is solid. 
And people go, how did you like that and be a Friday the 13th fan? There's more Jason in this than in the first film? How much of Jason is in the first film? Not as much as Jason in this. How much of Jason in the hockey mask is in this compared to the second film? Well, he doesn't wear a hockey mask. It's Ali. So technically, there's more of Jason in the hockey mask in this movie than in Friday the 13th Part 2. Even in Friday the 13th Part 3, Jason doesn't get the mask till late in the game. And you see him a couple times. It's not like he gets the mask 5 minutes in, or 10, or 15, or even 30 minutes in. He probably doesn't get the mask, what, till... Over the halfway mark, at least? Maybe... I was not, not an hour in, but I mean, that's a good chunk. So... I don't understand the whole thing where there's no mask, there's no Jason. There is Jason. It's a different kind of Jason. And it didn't. Technically, there's more Jason here, the beginning and ending alone, than the first film, or maybe even the second film, the hockey mask wise. So that, that's what I mean. I like the story. I like the idea. I just how some people view Halloween 6, is how I view this. And how I view Halloween 6 is how they view Jason Goes to Hell. So it is, it is what it is. It's just, that's different tastes. That's the meaning of different tastes. How so people love Halloween 6 and I fucking hate it and things a piece of shit. That's how people view this. Jason Goes to Hell I think has likable characters. I like John D. LeMay. I think John D. LeMay is one of the more likable characters in the franchise. And he's definitely one of the ones I can relate to. <clears throat> I like that his story is not just I need to survive but I want to rescue and save my baby. So it's nice to have a character in this type of movie have more motivation than just survival. It's I want to save this person as well. I like that. I think some bits of action, the director, this was his first time, he puts style. There's some style in this movie. You know, there's the slow-mo shooting the shit out of the possessed person and the, the police station. It's easily one of the glorious Friday 13 films. That's why it's one of the films that has a true uncut version. Well, if you have the uncut version of Part 7 of the New Blood, that would be as well. <clears throat> it has one of the best deaths in a Friday 13 film. With the woman having sex and gets split and have like a fucking wishbone. That may be the glorious death scene in any Jason film. And like I say, it goes by a quick pace, 80-some minutes. It's an interesting story. It's not just the same thing over and over again. I mean, Jason in the woods, I've seen that. They did that in the reboot and people still hated it. And I like the reboot. Like, what people wanted out of this, they did in the 2009 Friday the 13th, and people still hated the film. Now, is the film flaws? Yeah, I would like to have seen a bit more creativity in the kills. I've said that, but I still like the film, but a lot of people hate the film. I'm like, then what do people want in a Friday the 13th? We want to be different? This did it different. They want to be the same? 2009 was the same. They didn't like either one. I don't know. I don't know. But I, I love Stephen Williams. That's an interesting character as Duke. It has, this way, it has interesting scenes that's not just the killing scenes. Like the finger breaking in order to get information. I've never seen that before or since. That was creative. Like I said, to have a lead character that. Get away from a motherfucker! You know, it's a crowd pleasing moment. And don't get me wrong, th does the film have flaws? Yes. There are cheats when one is possessed, both of the people talk. Because it's supposed to be a fake out for the audience. That's a cheat because Jason would never talk. Even if you in another person's body. So it's just a completely other fucking cheat. So like there's moments like that that don't work. I agree with you. I'm not saying it's a flawless movie. I just don't think it's the piece of shit that some people view. It is. I disagree with that notion. 
<clears throat> was like the hidden. It's not a bad thing. I like the hidden. It's a better sequel to the hidden than. Speaking of which, this piece of shit. This piece of shit is a bad hidden movie. This is a good hidden movie. Well, the first. Okay, this is a good hidden sequel. <laughs> So I like how ambitious it was. And there's some style. There's a bit when the group of people are fighting over a gun in the cafe. And when it shoots, it goes to this POV where the camera pushes in. And we see like the bullet hit the the, the fuse box. Like, there's style, certain angles. Like when Steve, uh, John D. LeMay arrives at the Voorhees house. Yes, I know it's misspelled. Even Adam Green is pissed off about Adam Green. Adam Marcus. Adam Green did uh, the Hatchet films. Adam Marcus. Even he's pissed off. Oh, some guy fucking, they misspelled it. I don't know why they misspelled it and they shot it. It was such a rush production. But I know he's, he's pissed off about that. I know at one point he wants to do director's cut. I dare fucking T if, if he's able to do that, he would fix that. I mean, they fix that, other stuff. And I think it'd be even better. But I would love to see it. I would love to see it. It's never going to happen, but I would love to see it. I know they were making a documentary on the film, but... But, uh... What's going on delayed that. But yeah, Jason Goes to Hell, I still enjoy. Number three, Ninja Trolls 2, Secret of the Ooze. Now, the film did well when it came out, but it gets so hated on, that stupid fucking Ninja Turtle documentary, the definitive, yeah, so definitive, it's like 80 minutes long, it talks about, I don't know, 40% of the fucking history, a good chunk of it is missing, and oh, they're so definitive, there's gonna be a part two, it's been like seven years now, and there's no part two yet. But there's a part two coming, folks. Sure, wait another probably ten years. Maybe they'll get a part two. Maybe they'll get another 20%. Fuck that documentary. and Fuck those people. I don't give a shit. Fuck them fucking assholes. But anyway, that's not another thing. Oh, Secret of the Ooze. They talked about it for 30 seconds. They go, it sucks. Then they talked about the third film. They said, yeah, it sucks, but it's better than part two. Really, I, I don't understand that. If you feel that way, we agree to disagree. I don't understand the whole, well, part three is better than part two. I don't understand that for Robocop. When people say Robocop three is better than two, I don't understand for Ninja Turtles. When they say three is better than part two. Three, the turtles are like fuddlies. Fucking uglies. Splinter looks like he's dipped in the vat of KFC and Steve's adults going to eat him. Like, Ninja Turtles three... There's some nostalgic factor for me on that, but it's uh, uh, to me it's not good. Secret of the Ooze, yes, there's very 90 stuff to it. Yes, nostalgia does play a part into it. But I think there's a lot of legitimately fun things about the movie. I think it's a good flip of the coin from the first film, where the first film's more darker and serious, and yeah, I would prefer that. If you want to have a silly fun version that's more in tone with the cartoon, this did a hell lot better than the Michael Bay ones. And they had Crane and Bebop and Rocksteady. You know what? This film is better. The turtles look like the fucking turtles. The suits are fantastic. Even the suits on Tokar Razor are fantastic. Animatronically. The voices, I think this is the best voice cast of the turtles that they ever had. The voice of Donatello fits perfectly. I'm sorry. He fits more as Donatello than Corey Feldman does. I, I don't hate Corey Feldman. But he did not fit the voice of Donatello. This guy fits Donatello. Brian Tochi and Robbie Riz come back for the voices of Leo and Mighty. The guy who voiced Raph. Growing up, I thought it was the same voice as the guy in the first film. It wasn't until later I found out, oh, it's a different voice. And I liked Ernie Reyes Jr.'s Tino. And it has actual fight scenes. They don't use their weapons. 
you know, at this point, if it's not rated R, then I don't give a shit if they don't use their weapons. You want to know why? Because if whenever you're PG, PG-13, you're going to be limited when you have ninja weapons. A sword. Maybe you did away with like a cut that you barely see. But a sword stabs people. It slices people. Slices heads, slices necks, slices arms off. Leo can't do that unless it's rated R. And they will never make an R-rated film. Raph, if he has a sight, I want him to throw it in someone's fucking neck. Or stomach. Or stab someone. He can't do that. Michelangelo, he can't hit people in the face with nunchucks. Because it's being too, deemed too violent. So when you can't do it, then why have the weapons in the first place? Most of the time in the first film, they used it to block. Except Donatello and his bow. Mighty was able to use his nunchucks a little bit, but... You notice you don't have any like up-close shots of him hitting people with a nunchuck. Kind of like he hits it and then that it's kind of off-camera a little bit. Like he'll do this. Or this, but again, nothing really concrete. That's what I mean. If you don't do all this, then yeah, just have them fight with their their hands and their fists. I'm fine with that. Them fighting with their hands and fists. So the whole weapon's like again, does it have flaws? Yes. You there is no secret of the ooze and secret of the ooze. To me, that's the biggest flaw of the film, because originally it was supposed to be. Dr. Perry was an alien, and it's an Utrum, which is in the comic books, in the 2003 cartoon. This, that's what Crane in the 80s cartoon was inspired by. This group of aliens called the Utrums that has a little brain-like alien and an android type of body. And that was supposed to be the reveal, but then for stupid reasons, they didn't do that. They should have, otherwise this, the title makes no sense. The Secret of the Ooze, and there's no Secret of the Ooze. There's no secret to be found. So it is one of those things that the title doesn't make any fucking sense in terms of the movie because of what they cut out. Or I don't even know if they filmed it. I said cut out. So if they never filmed it, that sucks even more. So to me, that's the biggest flaw of the film. But I think it's a fun movie that does a nice job establishing the Turtles as characters. Not, well... I take that back. Not establish them as characters, but establish them as a family. That's the way I want to word it. I really get a sense they're a family in this. When they're just playing around, the way the four of them banter with each other, the way they talk with each other, the little moments I see, like uh, when Tino stomps on Raph's foot, and just a simple action, Mikey's doing this to Raph's head to calm him down, like petting him like you would an animal. Or just purposely trying to annoy him or saying all their names and go, well, the good one's in to know. Giving shit to Raphael. Which is something that happened a lot in incarnations. And really, of the movies, that's the only movie that does that, is the second film. And just the way they talked with each other, interacted with each other. Like I said, of all the films, well, the first one, first one, you really get a sense of them as a family. And that's what I liked about it. And again, the effects work is solid. I don't mind the lady that played April O'Neil. Yeah, I don't like Vanilla Ice. And where's the secret and the secret of the who's? But I still think it's a fun, entertaining sequel. I don't know if these new as bad as people make it out to be. And I'm sorry, it's not worse than the third film. And oh, it's so bad, Will it only give it 30 seconds in our definitive Turtles documentary. But they didn't go in depth on coming out of their shells tour. You know, we didn't go in depth on that though. Fuck the stuff I said about the secret of the ooze. That, that's not said in the definitive documentary, but it's so definitive. Yeah, it's so fucking definitive. Because I had an argument with those guys. You don't know what the fuck definitive means. And they're like, no, yes we do. No, you don't. But anyway. Well, you're just mad that's the title they used. I'm like, you're not getting the... That's the point. 
for yet. So number three, Secret of the Ooze. Number two, Ramble 3. I talked about this film uh, a lot. I love this film. I think it's a incredibly underrated sequel. Ramble 3, I never understood the hate for it. I never understood it. Stallone is awesome. He's a badass motherfucker. Whether it be the stiff fight, C4 arrow blowing up helicopters, hunting people in caves, blowing up more C4, uh, C4 explosives, getting a big ass fucking 50 caliber gun to shoot down helicopters, a big old fucking war at the end. Like, that's G.I. Joe. You know, that's my version of G.I. Joe, the ending of Rambo 3. Great Stonewall Stallone on a horse while explosions are around and a helicopter flying above him. All done for real on camera. Richard Crenna, Pulisi, Troutman, and actually him and Rambo being on the same playing field, on the same level, working together. That was a great uh, elevation of that character. I'm getting sick and tired of the whole, hey, he helped the Taliban. People who say that are ignorant of history. They're completely ignorant of history. They say that because they think they're fucking funny, only they failed on the FDL of fuck. To say that, you're ignorant on history. Number one, it doesn't mean every fucking person in that region is Taliban. That's like me going, you know what, I met a German person. Hmm, I wonder if he's a Nazi. Because remember Nazi? Like, no, it's not the fucking case. And you have to look at things during the time period. Do people not remember at one point in Japan, oh, I don't know, Pearl Harbor? Bombing? What's next? I'm going to hate the Ninja Turtles or I'm going to hate something with Ninja in it. Oh, Ninja Japan. They bombed Pearl Harbor. I guess we're helping the Pearl Harbor bombers. That would sound stupid, right? But they'll use that for Ramble 3. It's just idiotic. Maybe the Taliban doesn't exist in this continuity. Because Rambo was there. That's what they needed. They needed Rambo. Rambo fucked up the Russians. There you go. Maybe there's no Taliban in this continuity. You ever think of that? So he's called escapism entertainment. Maybe, the, maybe he made it so the Taliban never existed. Rambo 3 in his universe. That's how badass Rambo is. So that's... You want to look at it that way? I can look at it that way too. Awesome action scenes. Awesome one-liners. Who are you? Who are you? Your worst nightmare. <clears throat> to me, iconic 80s type of escapism. And the reason they fail and try to replicate that is that they don't understand it and they don't like it in the first place. Or they laugh at it. Or they think it's cheesy. They're not sincere. Which is why a lot of these 80s wannabe efforts nowadays fail. This is no sincerity to it. But these films, even Commando is sincere in what it's doing. Even when it's being funny... It's still a sense of sincerity. <clears throat> when he's trying to rescue his daughter, there's no laughing matter. Or he says a one-liner to fuck up a guy, but then he's dead serious, and he's on his mission to save his daughter. Same here, Rambo 3. Oh, Rambo's making jokes. He's not doing fucking stand-up. He's saying funny observations and badass one-liners. And they, they still fit. It's blue light. What does it do? It turns blue. That's not like a stand-up comic line. For people, oh, he's making jokes. So, I, Ramble 3, I never understood the hate for it. Never did. And number one, should be obvious for anyone who's been on my channel, Predator 2. Predator 2, to me, is, like I said, one of the most underrated films of all time I love Predator 2 I, uh, Predator 2 deserves so much more than it's given 
It's one of the fastest paced movies I've ever seen. I think it does give more to the mythology of the Predator. Gives him more tools for the job. Even more so about his uh, bit of more of his code of honor. Danny Glover's a badass motherfucker in it. Gary Busey, Robert Davi, Ruben Blades, Bill Paxton, may he rest in peace. The last 40 minutes is like one badass long chase scene where he's chasing the Predator, dealing with Deary Busey, the whole uh, slaughterhouse facility, which leads up to the rooftops, then leads into one apartment building to the next, then down below underground. Great one on one fight. It was cool that the Predator was in a city. I'm sorry, Arnold. It wasn't a bad idea. It's a cool idea. With it's What is so fucking awful with that idea? I don't understand. I don't understand why that's such an awful idea. I really do not. I really don't. I think it's fucking badass. Predator 2 tits a lot of movies' asses. It tits the ass out of Alien 3, Alien Resurrection, Predators, The Predator, fucking movies of today. Characters, great dialogue, you fuck yourself. As I can say here, I'm a fan. This is actually a gift. This is one of the best gifts I've ever got in my life. Fix that a little bit there, you know. With his gun there. <clears throat> so, yeah. As we can say, fuck yourself. No, I'm not going to end the video that way. Uh, Predator 2 is badass. It never got... It never. I never understood the hate for the film. There's no Arnold in it. So, the movie's just bad because there's no Arnold. Arnold's in Terminator Genesis. Does that mean it's good? Because he's in it? Arnold is in Terminator Dark Fate. I don't know. Yeah, that movie's good. Why? Because Arnold's in it. That's all it takes? That's pretty easy, then. A requirement. Do you love Junior, then? Arnold's in that. Killing Gunther? Arnold's in that. Do you love Killing Gunther? Have you heard of Killing Gunther? So, the, uh, Arnold's not in it. I don't understand that. Danny Glover did a great job. The cast of characters, the action. Predator is a badass in the movie. Killing the, the Jamaican gang members and the penthouse. Using all sorts of cool weapons. The creativity in making these weapons. Like the neck gun that sears into your skin. That's a really neat idea. The the disc. The badass. And the best is look. Because they try to revamp it in other films and it looks like shit. Don't fix what's not broken. The Predator 2, ferociously fast-paced, consistently entertaining. I'll always be the, the big fanboy of Predator 2. I'll be the guy that, that stands up and sticks up for Predator 2. I'm probably the guy that's talked more about Predator 2 than anybody on YouTube. But you know what? I'm proud of that. I'll talk about Predator 2 ten more times. I don't care. I, I can't. I'll talk about Predator 2 again, again, again. I won't be tired of it. But number one, Predator 2, Ramble 3, Turtles 2, Secret of the Ooze, Jason Goes to Hell, Tremors 2, The Universal Soldier of the Return, Teen with a Crystal Skull, Short Circuit 2, The Metro Reloaded, Slash Bad Boys 2, and Lethal Weapon 3. What are your top 10 underrated sequels? Not favorite sequels, underrated sequels feel free to list them down below should have said the beginning i don't know if people don't watch the whole video but like i said <clears throat> for anyone who watches this put down below your top 10 underrated not best not favorite underrated sequels feel free put it in the info box i mean uh in the comment section we'll see you guys later Bye bye